Knife Song, Korea, a novel by Richard Selzer. Part 1. Land of the Morning Calm. Chapter 1. He kept his head bowed all the way up the steep path. It was April, and the Korean hillsides, having persevered all winter, complaining under the snow, were suddenly extravagant with pink jindala, which broke out on their thick brown hides like a rash. It was cold as he neared the summit. He drew into himself less of a target to the wind. The ground was flat where he stood on a small plateau. On one side he could see the vast valley from which he had mounted. On the other he looked down upon the yellow sea. A misnomer, he thought. It's the gray sea, gray as a timber wolf and rabid lying on its side, flanks heaving with forced respiration and the spume of the waves like spittle bubbling from its jaws. Someone had carved a great stone Buddha on the summit. Sloan walked to it, leaned against the granite pedestal, and lit a cigarette. Until the east sea's waves are dry, went Aguka, the Korean national anthem. But the Buddha gazed out over the sea with an expression of nausea, as though even the sight of that ocean made him seasick. The faint grimace, the lowered lids, seemed to be a suppression of gastric distress. Like me, Sloane thought. Korea. With his entry into this country, he had begun the ordeal that would lead him to his manhood. Or death. Or both. Everything that had gone before. His decision to be a doctor. Medical school. Surgical training had taken place in a kind of nursery. He had been called doctor there, had gotten married, performed operations, delivered babies, but he had only been dressed in his father's clothes, playing grown-up, playing doctor. Why do you want to be a doctor? The chairman of the admissions committee had asked him. Sloane had looked at the center of his polka dot tie, the little knot like the head of a kingpin in the man's neck, which, if pulled, would cause that crew-cut, razor-lipped, small-eyed head to roll across the table like the yield of a guillotine. Who would wear such a tie at a time like this, with such a ridiculous white mustache, pencil-thin? With a straight face, he had said, "'I find the material interesting.' He had calculated it well in advance, knowing they would be looking for the slightest sign of frailty, softness, pity. He wouldn't be caught there, nor could he have told the simple truth. To swim in the very stream, sir, not walk alongside of it. No, he knew who they wanted him to be. Pure objective. Man of science. No faggotry. Be crisp and let them see you in a laboratory, titrating body fluids, not holding a hand, helping mankind, anchoring a heart to courage. No wit, either. Risk being a bit of a bore. I find the material interesting. And he was accepted. He had crossed the water on a troop transport along with twelve other doctors and the backbone of Medical Company 102 of the 7th Division Artillery. From Japan it was eastward until there was no more east. They had docked at midnight. It was January and cold in the darkness of an anemic moon, with flashlights courtly waving them on to a comfortless beginning. Loaded into the open back of a two-ton truck with thirty others of his kind, he was treated to his first Korean roads, so pitted and rutted as to be felt in every cell. Pressed close together, the men in the truck did not huddle for warmth. They did not even talk. It was a sober enactment of anxiety and the need not to show it. The intermittent flare of cigarettes made the truck seem infested with 
phosphorescent bugs. Now and then one of these insects would arc from the truck in an apparent suicide, easily understandable. By morning they were ensconced in an abandoned Japanese jail. Three to a cell plus rats made a crowd. Men and beasts crouched and eyed each other yellowly in the glare of a naked bulb. Sloane fell into a damp and restless sleep. They parted the next morning. The trip north was in the noisiest conveyance he had known, wheezing and coughing as if it had contracted emphysema from the dust. Sloan saw that the driver had at least two talents, driving through potholes and spitting. Each time they were catapulted doll-like, the driver would shake his head, lean out of the jeep, and propel a dollop of spittle into the cloud of brown and putrid dust. It had become twilight, and still they headed north. Sloan slouched in his seat, willing limpness into his body, giving himself up to the battering. He discovered that if he rested his elbows on his knees and let his bowed head swing forward freely between the shoulders, he could avoid the headache that came stronger and stronger with each transmission up the spinal column. He was certain that with each blow a tiny punctate hemorrhage appeared in his brain. He felt his cerebration dulling. If the trip were long enough, he would lumber from the jeep slope route and forever stupid. Korea. The name reminded him of a disease, Korea, characterized by aimless jerky movements of the body. St. Vitus dance. It was fitting. Since he felt no purpose here, his arms and his legs had no purpose either. With the decision not to resist, came a measure of relief. Small, to be sure, but enough to make thought again possible. He felt schizophrenic, as though he were watching himself from elsewhere, but the alienation gave a patina of numbness to his discomfort, like receiving a shot of morphine. The pain was still there, but one no longer cared. Between jolts, Pictures of his life slipped into view like lantern slides. He rejected each one until he saw himself at eight o'clock filing with the other white coats into the cold amphitheater for grand rounds. From this distance they looked like prisoners in a concentration camp, forced to watch an execution. The crime, surfeit of life, inadvertent misuse of the body. For a moment the picture stuck, and they were no more than gravestones on a hill. Last to arrive was the bed bearing the patient, abandoned in despair in the presentation pit at the center of the hall. Her black head protruded from the covers, an old cracked boot, tongue unslung and flipping over the side. Jesse Atkins is a sixty-eight-year-old widowed Negro female the intern intoned, who was admitted to the hospital ten days ago with the complaint of having fallen unconscious on the street. A hard jolt threw him bruisingly against the door. The driver swore softly and ground the gears. Sloan turned to the side and settled himself in the seat, his body seeking a comfort that was not there. With each hour of buffeting, Sloane's fear increased. It seemed incredible that he would ever return through this place. Were there, in fact, people at the end of this journey? People who expected him? Would there be edible food, clean water, conversation? Or, if it ever ended, if there were a destination, would it be a hillside, one of these many, with only himself to guard it, or whatever the army made men do with hillsides? He wanted a drink, an old-fashioned. Then he wanted to fly home. He closed his eyes. He would think of cool woods, blue skies, foxes, and pheasants.